you. It's, it's very humbling to be the last one in a great panel. This is the creme de la creme in here. This is what it is to be part of the women's movement. It's also humbling to be in your presence. Um, it reminds me a lot, particularly because yesterday marks exactly 20 years since I arrived in the U.S. And when I grew up in Iraq, um, in the middle of the Iran-Iraq war, I was seven when my family brought a live-in maid. She was nine years old. Two years only older than me. This is not an easy story for me to tell you. I'm very ashamed, actually, of this story. This was a child labor that my family employed. Her family brought her to my family and asked that we would hire her because they needed the salary that we would pay so she can send her brothers to school. My family told me she's equal to me, but the truth is she was not that equal. I went to school in the morning. She cleaned the house in the morning. I did my homework in the evening. She went to school in the evening. That's my family's definition of treating her equally, um, as in we sent her to school. For every five dresses I got, she got one dress. She watched TV with us in the living room, but the truth is when my father or my mother wanted something, it was her who jumped and got a glass of water or whatever they wanted. She never ate with us in the same dining room. I had my room and my bed and she slept on the floor. And yet she was my friend and I loved her. And I'm very ashamed that that I was part of a child labor experience. And when she was a teenager, her family demanded her back. They wanted her back because uh, they wanted to marry her off. And she got married, and I never saw her. And it's been 20 years, and I don't know where her whereabout is. Um, I was ashamed to tell the story. I was also ashamed to say that I actually also was, uh, got married at the age of 19, also in an arranged marriage to a guy I did not know. I was also very ashamed to say that he violated me, he raped me, he abused me. Um, I was very embarrassed to say these things because I thought if I tell the world these things, it would not, you would not respect me. And that you would not see that I am a very strong woman. Or at that time, girl, I suppose. Um, but I believe that we have to break our silence and the journey starts with each one of us breaking our silence. We each have a story. Radia, the name of the girl that worked for my house, was from a very poor family and she has a huge story. And I grew up in a wealthy family and I too have a story. We each have a story. And unless we each tell our stories, and break our silence, and speak up, and speak out, we will never, ever stop that vicious cycle of oppression and injustice against all girls and women. So that will number one. And it applies to all the stories that the panelists have uh, talked about. Second, we have responsibilities towards each other and towards ourselves. The injustice girls are facing all over the world, and so are women, is not a third world only issue, it's not only a poor issue. We face it as much as in corporates, in the corporate world, in the CEO world, in the world of the G20 leaders that you're going to talk with, as we do in very poor countries. We face it as much as in boardrooms of women discriminated against as are women who are from. We have a responsibility towards ourselves and towards the others. This is not only about saving other girls out there. This is about starting saving yourself in here. And you have to have that acknowledgement. Now for me, I was lucky, unlike Radim. My arranged marriage was in America. And so when I left the arranged marriage and I had no money whatsoever, I eventually, I, well, I was in a country that provided me opportunities, so I eventually went back to finish my college, 
and I eventually started an organization called Women for Women International when I was 23 years old. And I eventually dedicated my life to helping women survivors of war. So I go to different war zones in Iraq, in, Go in Bosnia, in Congo, in Kosovo, in Rwanda, and I urge women to break their silence, and I urge women in, in all over parts of the world to help one woman at a time by sending her $27 a month and write a letter to her to tell her your story, not only send her your check, and hear her story and not only feel bad for her. It's, it's, a, it's a mutual exchange in a respectful way. And only a month ago, I learned what happened to Radina because of the program that I created 17 years ago. My colleagues in Iraq, one of the countries that Women for Women International works in, emailed me a picture of myself as a child. And they said, is that you? She is one of the members of Women for Women International program. We're helping her in our program. And she wrote a letter to the American woman who is sponsoring her, telling her when I was a child, I worked in that family's home, and they had a daughter, and her name is Zainab, and that is me. No, thank God she said good things about me. <laughs> but what goes around comes around. And what I thought that I was helping myself end up helping the very woman I've been seeking for the last 20 years. And there are a few rules that I learned in this experience. I told you about the first two. Break your silence. Speak up. Speak out. Your responsibility is towards yourself and towards others. And you must, must make sure that every single girl and woman has control over resources so she can stand up on her own feet and not go through what Radia has gone through. Being sent to work as a maid so her brothers can work and go to school. So her brothers can just go to school rather. Every woman has to have control of our economic resources. If you talk about food security, Women and girls are 80% of the farmers in the world. We are producing 66% of the food in the world. We are producing 90% of all rice and maize and corn in the world. But we only earn 10% of that income. And we only own 2% of that land. And unless we change that, we will always be stuck in that vicious cycle that our generations before us have been stuck on. It is indeed time to change that. There must be accountability towards women access to economic resources and our control of it. The records and statistics have been quoted for you. Earlier, I can just give you a couple of more just to refresh your energy. For every year in girl schooling, it impacts her ability to create an income by 10 to 20 percent. For every one percent increase in work in girls' education, she impacts 0.3 percent in her economic growth of the country and the economic growth of her own country. Female employment in rich countries have directly impacted GDP growth and their economic sustainability. Board companies that have 50% of women in its board has 66% more profits than companies that do not have women in their board or less a number of women in the board. And, and countries like North or regions like North Africa, when they do not have women in economic, fully active in economic sectors of their countries, their economic growth is reduced by from 0.9% to 1.7%. There's a direct co correlation, there's a co direct connection between our own economic growth and access and control over resources our own lives, our own freedoms, and the countries that we are living in. So, what are the solutions? Because I think there are lots of facts that has been shared with you. One is we must 
hold everyone accountable. You are living in a world that the generations before you have managed to get women and girls out in the public. Governments are courting girls and women in their documents. But we are now, the struggle is to hold them accountable. We need to measure. This is your work, this is all our work. We need to measure how much money are they allocating to girls and women. We are no longer accepting the two, the two cents out of every number. You need, you know, I was um, in, a, in, a, in a panel the other week and they said we have spent half a billion dollars on girls and women in Iraq and Afghanistan. But no one compared it to the one trillion dollars that was spent on the war itself. So you should not ask for only how much is being spent. You should ask for how much is being spent compared to, to the larger spending. Second, you must hold everyone accountable. Companies who do not have women in their boards or senior management, we should do something. We should not buy their products to say the least. You know? <laughs> um, countries who are not allocating enough resources for the girls' education, you should campaign against them or do something with them. You must hold your own governments and every single leader accountable for their own spending and their own resource allocations for women. In countries like Rwanda, the government has a, what's considered gender monitoring committee. These are committee of people, who, of women, who go to every single ministry and every single mayor and every single chief and make sure how much money he or she is spending on women and girls. And they are reporting it directly to the president. Unless we hold everyone accountable for their own deliveries, we will not be able to move from walking the walk to talking the talk. To, from talking the talk to walking the walk. It is time to walk the walk right now. Another thing, the solutions are not in microfinance only. I think a lot of times when we talk about economic access to girls and women, we immediately go to microfinance, which is a great solution, do not take me wrong. But it is not good enough to have it be the only solution for us. Not every girl or woman wants a microloan, and those who want Bravo, Fantastic, they are the best entrepreneurs. But we cannot only, when we talk about solutions and financial solutions, we cannot stop at micro loans for women and girls as the only solution. We, talk, we must talk about jobs, we must talk about market linkage to the private sector, we must talk about government accountability to creating jobs and employment for women and girls. And it's not only microfinance. Um, Last but not least, your political participation is crucial. We need to increase. We have now enough laws that says women and girl, well, women get 25% quotas in political representation. But we really have to make sure that we're getting there, the right women out there. We need to make sure that when you finish your education and when you lobby, you do not stay at home. You, because that's one issue actually we're facing with a lot of the developed countries. Girls are staying at home and not going to work. You owe it to yourself and to the whole countries that you're working and living in. Your political participation is a must. Be it a vote or hopefully a run for election and for office. It is time for us to have 50% of all politicians to be women. And hopefully by the time you get my age and we're meeting at the G20, you're meeting with half of the G20 are women. But how many women right now? One, I think, yeah. you know, one. Not good enough. So, um, it is time. It is time for us to quote Swan and others to, to rejuvenate a sense of a global movement. It is time for us to make this movement not only about girls in third world countries or women in poor countries, it is about all of us in Canada as much as in Afghanistan, in Iraq as much as in the UK, in Congo as much as in France. I don't know. 
Um, so that's one thing. It is time for us to break our silence. It is time for us to unite together, not to put each other down. It is time for us to coordinate with each other's activities. It is time for us to engage and hold everyone accountable. And to quote my favorite man, Rumi, a 13th century Sufi poet, it is time to make the field a much bigger place. He says, out beyond the world of right doings and wrong doings, there is a field. I shall meet you there. But when the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other no longer makes any sense. It is time for us to meet in that field and make that field a girls' and women's field. It's time for us to invite all the men and all the boys we know in that field and make that movement a joint movement for all of humanity's sake. I know, and I'm a bit older than you, I do not want to be of the generation who have lived through a financial crisis and not took advantage of it. You have a crucial opportunity in front of you, and you're representing all of us in this opportunity. You must hold your leaders, the leaders you're going to meet, accountable for their deliveries. This is our time to make this century a women's century. Thank you.